for blood test number six in 2025, when using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, we saw that my biological age was 17 years younger than the chronological. And if you missed that video, I linked to it in the right corner. So what might be contributing to these data? Let's start off with prescription meds. And for those who are familiar with the channel, you know that I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, so I've been taking thyroid hormones for more than half of my life. More recently, the dose has been split into T4 and T3, so 75 micrograms per day of levothyroxine and 20 micrograms per day of cytomel. And that's it for prescription meds, no rapamycin or anything else. Which then brings us to supplements. Now here too, if you're familiar with the channel, you know that I've been taking vitamin D, 1,000 to 2,000 IUs per day, more recently 2,000 IUs per day, for at least nine months out of the year as I lived in the Northeast in the United States, in Boston, where sun exposure, full body sun, sun exposure is only for a few months out of the year. So when considering that I recently moved to Texas, I completely took vitamin D out, supplemental vitamin D out. As I mentioned, I've been getting 20 minutes per day front and back of full body sun exposure, intentional full body sun exposure. I'm not anti-sun by no means. What was the impact on circulating levels of vitamin D? That's what we'll see here. And for this test, circulating levels of vitamin D or 25 hydroxy vitamin D was 53 nanograms per mil which then raises the question, what's optimal for circulating levels of vitamin D? Now the lab gives a reference range of 30 to 100 nanograms per mil, which doesn't give us much insight. But interesting, interestingly, they also recommend an optimal range of greater than 30 nanograms per mil. And here too, if you're familiar with the channel, you know that generally the lab's reference range and what I consider the optimal range don't match. So is that true for circulating levels of vitamin D? Now, to find out, I have a new Patreon tier dedicated specifically to what's optimal for biomarkers, which includes not only vitamin D, but 34 other biomarkers, more than two hours of video content, 52 published references. And again, these aren't the reference ranges which you can get from any LLM these days. This is what may be optimal based on how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or their associations with risk of death for all causes in the largest published studies that exist. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And when doing that, and when, in my reading of the literature on vitamin D in large meta-analyses, greater than 30, this is a rare case where the lab's optimal range, their proposed optimal range, actually agrees with the Lust Garden optimal range of greater than 30 nanograms per mil. Now, I get that some of you will say, well, what about in this study where higher than 30 was associated with a lower risk of death for all causes? This is true. There are individual studies that suggest higher than 30 may be optimal. But when those studies are included into the meta-analysis, it, it then flattens out that risk at just greater than 30. So I'm open to the idea that higher than 30 could be optimal, but that requires additional testing. For example, biomarker versus biomarker. So circulating levels of vitamin D versus almost 30 or more big picture biomarkers, liver, kidney, immune, et cetera. And then how do the correlations look for circulating levels of vitamin D versus these other standardized big picture biomarkers to craft one's own personalized recipe for circulating levels of vitamin D. Now, I intend on measuring vitamin D for at least the next five tests going forward, so all through the winter here in Austin, and then probably into early summer next year so that I can see what it looks like without supplemental vitamin D or very low levels of supplemental vitamin D. So I should have five or six tests where I can do a biomarker versus biomarker analysis. So stay tuned for that video at some point. All right, so next up in terms of supplements is nicotinamide as I supplemented with it by itself to try to increase NAD. So can nicotinamide by itself increase NAD? So to find out, again, as I mentioned, I supplemented with nicotinamide, an average of 464 milligrams per day. And I did that from July 31st through September 15th. But note that this is only part of the dietary period from test five to test number six, as that period started immediately after test number five on July 22nd through September 15th, the day before test number six on September 16th. Now that not in between that nine day period, why I didn't supplement with nicotinamide is because I was waiting on NED test results that I took on July 22nd. So once I got the test results, then I crafted the plan to try to impact NAD for test number six. To find out NAD levels, I sent my blood and I've been sending my blood to Ginfinity. And if you wanna measure your own NAD levels using this test, there's a discount link in the video's description. So on the same day as testing all of the biological age metrics and a whole bunch of other stuff, I also measured NAD. And on that day, it was 21.2 micromolar. 
So whether that's good or not, it's generally considered to be low. Values greater than 40 micromolar and up to as high as 100 micromolar is considered quote unquote optimal. And I put that in air quotes because I'm still trying to sort out what's optimal for NAD by looking at correlations with other biomarkers. Again, that biomarker versus biomarker analysis. So how does this NAD equals 21 micromolar compare against NAD precursors to go back to addressing that question of can nicotinamide by itself increase NAD? So as I mentioned, I've been measuring NAD a lot. 2023, 2024, and 2025 with 30 tests over, the, over this three year span. And again, I've been doing that because I wanna to try to find my own personalized NAD level that may be optimal. I don't wanna get it into some optimal range. I wanna truly see if 30 micromolar or is it 40 micromolar, what value is associated with more biomarkers going in the right direction versus wrong for NAD. So first, let's take a look at the NAD precursor story though and compare it against nicotinamide. Again, going back to that original question of can nicotinamide by itself increase NAD. So I've supplemented with nicotinic acid or NA 300, around 300 milligrams per day, and that's increased NAD to around 60 to 67 micromolar, which is 3x higher at a lower dose than the 464 milligrams per day of, nicotinic, uh, of nicotinamide. Sorry. So we can see that nicotinic acid may be better than nicotinamide for raising NAD. And note that they are both niacin isoforms. So nicotinic acid would be the better form for raising NAD, at least in my case, and maybe different for others. I've also supplemented, supplemented with lower doses of nicotinic acid, 100 milligrams per day. And there you can see I got it into the 42 to 48 micromolar range, still way better than 500 milligrams per day of nicotinamide. But the most appropriate comparison may be with NMN, as NMN contains nicotinamide mononucleotide. In other, in other words, the basis for NMN raising NAD the majority of that is coming from nicotinamide. Granted, you need mononucleotide attached to nicotinamide, but without nicotinamide in NMN, you're not gonna raise NAD. So high dose nicotinamide, two grams per day, raised my NAD to 61 micromolar, three X higher than nicotinamide. A thousand milligrams of NMN raised my NAD to 39 micromolar, still way better than nicotinamide's 21 micromolar. But the most appropriate comparison would be low dose NMN. 300 milligrams per day, which led to an NED level of 25 micromolar. So what we can see from these 30 tests is in not just that nicotinic acid is better than nicotinamide in terms of raising NAD, but that 500 milligrams per day of nicotinamide was a bit worse than 300 milligrams per day of NMN in terms of NAD. Now that's one way to look at it. The other is maybe 25 versus 21 micromolar really isn't a big difference. Nonetheless, both are on the lower side and I clearly have easier ways to raise NAD levels. On the other hand, when considering that my test, the test before this in August, NAD levels were about 15 micromolar, I may have gotten a small NAD jump of about six micromolar by supplementing with nicotinamide. So nicotinamide by itself may not be useless in terms of raising NAD, but a six micromolar bump, maybe not that big of a deal, especially considering I've had values as high as 67 micromolar. All right, so I'm also taking supplements aimed at homocysteine reduction. So first, why is homocysteine important? And I get that homocysteine is important as a cardiovascular disease risk biomarker, but there's a, there are other reasons why it may be important. And two of those, which I'm just gonna briefly cover in this video because this, this is a story for another day, are that homocysteine is neurotoxic, as shown in this paper, and homocysteine accelerates cell senescence, at least for endothelial cells. And again, this is a story for another day. I don't wanna take a long side tangent with this, but stay tuned for that video at some point, which then raises the question, okay, what's my data? So for this test, homocysteine was 8.8 .8 micromolar. And in terms of what's optimal, first, we can see that the reference range, I'd be good based on that at anything less than 15.2 micromolar is considered uh, within the reference range. Now, I haven't made a video yet and put it onto the what's optimal tier on Patreon, but lower is better in terms of homocysteine, and my target is less than five micromolar. And I should say too that when it comes to optimal ranges, I tend to be very strict, a strict interpretation of the literature to try to maximally reduce risk of death for all causes. So I get that five micromolar is very low, but based on my reading of the literature, values less than five may be optimal. So based on that metric, my 8.8 .8 micromolar is actually not great news. It's a bit far from five micromolar, but this is only part of the story homocysteine increases during aging. So it's important to resist its age-related increase. 
And within that context, I have 49 tests going back 20 years for homocysteine, which is what we'll begin to see here. On the y-axis, we've got homocysteine, and that's plotted against age on the x. So when I first started measuring, you can see that my average homocysteine over six tests was 7.1 micromolar, including two tests close to my optimal range or my optimal target of five micromolar. And then, unfortunately, I forgot about it for about 10 years. I didn't understand the importance of homocysteine at that time, so I stopped measuring it. But then as the evidence has been accumulating and I've uh, dived deeper into the literature, I realized it's an important biomarker to track. So I started tracking it more often, as shown there, over the past seven, seven years. 43 tests over those past seven years. And just because I've tested more often doesn't mean that the data is better, because we can see that homocysteine has increased from that earlier period, from seven micromolar to an average of 10.3 micromolar. So here too, in terms of avoiding that age-related increase, that doesn't get a check. And we can see why homocysteine is a major weak spot in my data, as for every test, almost, almost every test, going back maybe 15 or 17 years, I've, I haven't gotten it close to that five micromolar target and all values have been higher than that five micromolar target since then. So this is bad news. How much of a dent it would make on overall neurodegeneration or cell senescence, I don't know, but if it's up to me, I'm trying to keep it at five micromolar indefinitely. And that's the plan. So how am I gonna do that? What lowers homocysteine? And I get there are some of you that are screaming at the screen right now, betaine, trimethylglycine. I get that, I'm gonna show that. We'll get to that in a second, but let's focus on what the lab suggests first, which is folate or vitamin B12. And we'll do that by looking at homocysteine metabolism as shown here in this image. So starting with dietary intake of folic acid, that's converted into serum folate by the action of the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase gene. Now MTHFR requires FAD, which also requires riboflavin or, or vitamin B2 to make FAD, which is required for MTHFR activity. So if you're deficient in riboflavin, that could reduce MTHFR activity, thereby reducing conversion of folic acid into serum levels of folate. So with that in mind, in terms of supplements aimed at decreasing homocysteine, for the past couple of tests, I've increased or I've added supplemental riboflavin. Very low dose for now. Note that maximal absorption for riboflavin through the small intestine into the blood is about 30 milligrams per day. So I've been titrating upwards for the past two tests, getting closer to that, well, relatively closer, nine milligrams per day to that 30 milligram per day maximal dose. And at some point I may go, go all the way up to 30 milligrams per day of riboflavin. In terms of how I'm getting very low doses of riboflavin, I make my own stock solution. So you can't generally get nine milligrams per day of riboflavin, but what you, what you can get here, at least in the States, are 400 milligram capsules. So what I do is I open up the capsules, I weigh out the contents, and then take about 100 milligrams because it's not very water soluble either. It's water solubility is limited. But we can dissolve about 100 milligrams of riboflavin in one liter, which is its limit for water solubility. So that's what I've been doing. And if anybody wants to see that video, I'll put riboflavin in the pinned comment and just upvote it if you're interested in seeing me make a, a stock solution of riboflavin. All right, so then serum levels of folate combined with vitamin B2 and then convert homocysteine into methionine via the action of methionine synthase. So with that in mind, I've been supplementing also with methyl B12 and methylfolate, but also vitamin B6, which is a part of that tri-supplement stack. That's one pill. 1,000 micrograms per day of methyl B12, 400 micrograms per day of methylfolate, and 1.5 milligrams per day of vitamin B6. So those are, that's the main pathway that the lab report suggests to lower homocysteine. And in my case, vitamin B12 is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine, but it's only about a 10% effect. So if my average is 10 and that gets me to nine, it's still not, not that big of a deal. Now, going back to the betaine story, now we can see that betaine is involved in homocysteine metabolism where it combines with homocysteine, thereby converting it into methionine and dimethylglycine. Now, I, I should mention that I've tried high dose betaine in the past, four grams per day, and it didn't make a dent on homocysteine. But what I may have been missing was zinc. Dietary intake of zinc, my dietary intake, has always been close to the RDA, which I assumed was fine. But when considering that the BHMT, or betaine homocysteine methyltransferase, uh, protein converts homocysteine into methionine, if zinc is low, as that is required for BHMT activity, then BHMT activity will be low and the conversion of homocysteine into methionine will be low, thereby leading to an accumulation of homocysteine. So one can take betaine 
and still not see their homocysteine go down as it's been in my case in the past. So with that in mind, for this test, I, I supplemented with 1.4, an average of 1.4 grams per day of betaine. And I should mention there too, I'm not weighing out 1.4 grams every day. I'm making a stock solution where I'm dissolving a certain amount in about a liter of water and then drinking a small aliquot of that every day. And then I'm also supplementing with zinc, 15 milligrams per day. So which part of this story is related to reducing my homocysteine to close to its lowest level over about the past two years, 8.8 .8 micromolar? I'm not yet sure if it's the methyl B12 and folate story or if it's the zinc and betaine story, but to test that as a heads up for test number seven, I've taken out the B12 and folate for the next test and increased betaine up to around five to six grams per day. So we'll see if that's driving the homocysteine going down in my case. Now note that there's a third way we can potentially lower homocysteine, and that's by serine, the amino acid serine plus vitamin B6. And I should say that I'm not paying too much attention to that pathway in this video because there too, I've tried it. I've worked my way up to six grams per day of serine in combination with vitamin B6, and it didn't make a dent at all to homocysteine. I'm currently focused on the other ways to potentially reduce it, the folate B12 and betaine, rather than serine plus vitamin B6, which converts homocysteine into cystathionine. And that's it for supplements. No, as I mentioned, no GEER protectors or senolytics, at least for now. I don't see a need to do that now as the majority of my biomarkers are youthful with some exceptions. Again, NAD, homocysteine, DHEA sulfate, which then brings us to diet. What diet composition corresponds to this test? And I just started working on that. So stay tuned for that in an upcoming video. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I offer blood test consults and I post at least twice per day in four other Patreon tiers. We've also got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, the clearly filtered water filter, which I use every day, at-home metabolomics, I'm up to test number 20, or microbiome composition, NED testing with Genfinity, as I mentioned in the video, epigenetic testing with True Diagnostic, at-home blood testing with Sidebox Health, which includes the best epigenetic clock of epigenetic clocks, Grimage, green tea, which I drink every day, diet tracking with Coronameter, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, including data is my North Star, figuring stuff out is my drug, which I've got on here, and the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying logo as shown there. So if you're interested in that, link in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.